Good afternoon. A very warm welcome in every sense of the word from us here from the European Parliament Office in London and the European Parliament Office in Dublin for our very first joint event webinar and we hope that this won't be the last on the impact of Brexit on Ireland, the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. My name is Susanne Oberhaus and I'm the head of the Parliament Office in London. Now, one of our main tasks here is to support and to promote interparliamentary cooperation and dialogue between the European Parliament and the UK Parliament and also the regional assemblies in the UK. And to deepen this dialogue and exchange, we are very pleased to have with us today a most distinguished panel to discuss today with us. So, we have, first of all, Marit McGuinness, who is the first vice president of the European Parliament, one of the most senior members of our parliament and with a very strong track record on all matters to do with Brexit and especially its impact on the communities on both sides of the, of the border. We do also have, uh, very pleased to have Lord Canul, the chair of the EU committee in the House of Lords. Um, who has at the beginning of this month published a very a report on the Irish protocol which uh, offers a very timely and useful guide to this protocol to the withdrawal agreement and last but not least I'm very pleased that we have now joining Naomi Long Minister of Justice in the Northern Ireland Executive um, and leader of the Alliance Party of Northern Ireland and who also has been a member of the European Parliament, so very welcome here. Now, as has been pointed out by both the European Parliament in its recent resolution and the House of Lords report, the Protocol of no on Northern Ireland is a crucial part of the withdrawal agreement, but yet important progress on its implementation is yet to be made and that is also against the background on the, of the stalling negotiations uh, as regards the future EU-UK trade agreement. And as the House of Lords report points out, the combination of uncertainty, lack of momentum and lack of time com compounded by the shock of the COVID-19 pandemic is a potent threat to economic prosperity and political stability in Northern Ireland. So today we will try to explore in more detail what is at stake here and what exactly needs to be done in those few months remaining until the end of the transition period in order to avoid that threat. And to guide us through this complex topic, we could not have wished for a more profound connoisseur of the matter than Dr. Katie Hayward from Queen's University in Belfast, who has researched, written, spoken extensively on all questions in relation to Ireland, Northern Ireland, its border, the peace process, Brexit and EU integration. So without further ado, I'm very happy to hand over to Katie, who will steer us through this discussion. And I wish everybody a very stimulating and interesting beginning of the afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Suzanne. And it's a real uh, privilege and an honor to uh, be invited to moderate this discussion. Um, and it's uh, a panel, I'm sure everyone will agree, that is composed of people who've made um, really remarkable contributions to this whole Brexit process um, through their political leadership, but also through the, the sharpness of and uh, um, acute contributions that they've made with their um, uh, with their ability to, to scrutinize this very messy and complicated process. Um, this is a very special event for several reasons, uh, partly, of course, because it's been jointly hosted by the European Parliament offices in the UK and Ireland. Um, and at a time like this, that's particularly symbolic, I think, as well as um, uh, practically important. So that's important to note and uh, very significant, I think. It's also a special event because it's online and uh, this enables us to have such a wide range of participants and you're all very warmly welcome from wherever you're joining us. Um, and it also enables us to um, be quite open in the, in the question and answer discussion. So please use the question uh, function to, to, uh, 
type in what que ever question you'd like to address to the panel um, after we've made a, after they've made their initial contributions. And uh, just because of the nature of this and how uh, it's slightly complicated to coordinate. So um, apologies if you see me looking at my phone, it's just because of the WhatsApp group that's behind all of this, uh, trying to make sure everything runs smoothly. Um, it, and uh, it's also important, I think, as an event, because the focus is on Brexit and the island of Ireland. And uh, I think that's uh, worth noting, that it's not specifically about the protocol. It's not even specifically about the border, be it the land border or the sea border. It's about the island itself. Um, and of course, uh, the, the relationships between these two islands are um, integrally linked, as we will see, no doubt, in the contributions to be made by our panelists here. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning, it's a special event because of who is um, on the panel. And so I would just like to introduce them in a little bit more detail. Um, first, Mairead McGuinness. Um, Mairead McGuinness is the first vice president of the European Parliament. As first vice president, she oversees relations with national parliaments, in particular with the EU affairs committees of member state parliaments, who of course play a really important role. A member of the Parliament's Committee for Overseeing the Brexit Withdrawal Agreement, AFCO, she is also chair of the Parliament's Working Group on the Administrative Consequences of Brexit. She has responsibility for the Parliament's dialogue with churches, religious associations or communities, and philosophical and non-confessional organisations on EU policies and legislative proposals. She's also Vice President with responsibility for North America. Raid is a member of the Parliament's Committees on Agriculture and Rural Development, Environment, Public Health and Food Safety and Constitutional Affairs. Um, Mairead um, has, has achieved particular kudos, I think, for her handling of rather rowdy moments in the European Parliament, uh, which, um, which, uh, which were much appreciated, I think, by, by people at the time and uh, showed just uh, um, how outstanding she is a, as a parliamentarian. So um, welcome, Mairead. Uh, Lord Canole is our second panellist. He has been chair of the European Union Committee and principal deputy chairman of committees since September 2019, when he left the crossbenches and became a non-affiliated peer. He has also served as a deputy speaker since becoming principal deputy chairman of committees. He was elected to sit in the House of Lords at a crossbench heredity peers by-election on the 4th of February 2015. On the 19th of March 2015, he made his maiden speech in the House of Lords on a report of the Science and Technology Committee. In June 2015, he was appointed to the Select Committee on Social Mobility. In 2016, he served on the Select Committee on the Trade Union Bill. And in May 2016, he was appointed to the Select Committee on the European Union and the EU Justice Subcommittee. And as someone who has been um, privileged to be able to give evidence before his committee on a number of occasions, I can say he is um, an exemplary chair and, um, uh, and the reports produced, of course, by your committee are really outstanding and have been um, uh, made a very important contribution to our understanding of the whole process of Brexit and its impact on the island. So thank you. And then uh, finally, Naomi Long, a lifelong resident of East Belfast. Naomi has served as Minister for Justice in the Northern Ireland Executive since January 2020 and has been leader of the Alliance Party since October 2016. Politically active since her early 20s, she joined the Alliance Party in the mid 1990s and was first elected to Belfast City Council in 2001 and to the Northern Ireland Assembly in 2003. She became the first Alliance MP ever elected to Westminster in a very memorable election where she served from 2010 to 2015. In May 2016, Naomi returned to the Northern Ireland Assembly as MLA for East Belfast before becoming leader of Alliance that October. Since then, she's led Alliance through three of the Alliance Party's most successful elections, one of which, of course, was last year when Naomi was elected as Alliance's first MEP, and also in the 2019 general election where the party further increased its vote and uh, Stephen Farry was returned. Having served as local councillor, MLA, MP and MEP, Long is the only active politician in Northern Ireland to have served in every elected position, as well as having served as mayor, party leader, deputy leader, and now minister at a really critical time for Northern Ireland. Um, and regardless of anybody's party background, I think everybody agrees that she's highly re regarded as a very impressive politician, um, not least for her fearlessness. So um, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Mairead McGuinness now to make her introductory remarks. Thank you. 
Glad Great to be joined story. by colleagues that I know very well um, over the last couple of years because of Brexit. So there's been good, good, rather some good things come out of it because I've got to know both Charles and Naomi. And indeed, I want to say that I'm sitting in the centre of the European Parliament here in Brussels. It's a Friday and I thought it would be really quiet and I'm hoping uh, it remains thus because there's been some activity before I came live to you. Now to the subject and content of what I think is a really important event today because it is looking at Brexit not in a narrow context but looking at it in the context of the island of Ireland. And to some extent, I think the pandemic has taken over all of our lives and that while Brexit might be the item on our agenda politically, in fact, it isn't because we're dealing with such a public health crisis. And we have to take account of that and the impact it's having indeed on the negotiations. Here in the European Parliament, just last week, we had a very significant resolution on the Parliament's view about Brexit and the state of play. And within that resolution, we talked about full implementation of the withdrawal agreement. To some extent, there is slight concern that because the withdrawal agreement is signed up to, um, that we might forget about its implementation. So I think it's really important that it is fully implemented. There are three core elements to that agreement and they all need to be implemented. The resolution also spoke about the future and there is no doubt that the European Parliament wants a very strong relationship with the United Kingdom. We believe that that is in all of our interests. But I think there's also a shared view that we won't, or if you like, support a deal at any cost. And I think that this needs to be understood by our counterparts in the United Kingdom. Uh, Michel Barnier addressed us during that debate, and again, he got our full support for the work he is doing. Needless to say, the issue of time was on our mind last week because there is a deep concern that given the fact that we are now almost into July, where we hope negotiations will step up a gear, there is rather little uh, time uh, on both strands to implement the withdrawal agreement at full and also to come to a, a good a relationship with the United Kingdom around trade and many other issues. And in fact, on the future relationship, the real deadline is October, because as you know, whatever is agreed needs to be ratified, not just in this House, the European Parliament, but by national parliaments. And I've just come from um, a conversation with the chairs of the European Affairs Committees of national parliaments. We were briefed by Michel Barnier on the state of play. And all of the national parliaments around Europe are looking very closely at what's happening on both strands, on the withdrawal agreement, implementation and on the future partnership. So I think it behoves us all to, I suppose, focus on reality and to hope that in the next um, coming weeks, uh, I think the British Prime Minister thinks we can do this by the end of July and I'm all for that deadline if it can be achieved. Perhaps that's not as realistic as giving it more time, but we certainly hope that something can be put in place uh, before the um, October deadline, which is the deadline we have in mind. To talk a little about the structures here in the Parliament, because the responsibility has now moved from the withdrawal part, which was the constitutional affairs, to trade and foreign affairs committees who are handling uh, this future relationship. And again, they were responsible for the resolution. My colleague David McAllister is the key person here in the Parliament linking up on all Brexit related issues. And, you know, we are becoming more heightened in our awareness. Um, clearly, the pandemic has taken some of the political energy, rightly so. But we now realise that Brexit is you know, it could come upon us rather sudden and none of us want to see a no deal. On the other hand, the Commission and Member States continue to prepare for that possibility. And then I tried to make the link with our topic today, which is Brexit and the island of Ireland. And it's just very true to say that the future shape and relationships um, going forward will be determined by full implementation of the withdrawal agreement, but also the sort of deal that comes from our discussions in the coming weeks. And therefore, we are very supportive of the EU, the uh, lead negotiator, Michel Barnier. We also, um, you know, salute his determination to keep everyone involved. He's been extremely transparent right throughout what feels like decades, although I think it's four years. Um, and he's been continuing on that basis so that nobody at European level is left out of the picture as to what's happening. And I suppose the good news from my earlier conversation with Michel Barnier is that he remains optimistic, although he listed the obstacles 
obstacles that might be in our way to achieve that future partnership. So in terms of where this parliament sits, um, we want that strong relationship, but we also are watching very carefully uh, the future, um, not just the future deal, but the implementation of the withdrawal agreement, because many members of this house have made it their business to become fully aware of the island of Ireland issues, uh, the detail of the protocol. And I think that's really positive that there is that shared concern. So I will leave those as my opening remarks for this part of the conversation and to say that at EU level, at the parliament level, full engagement, some concern, but hoping that the negotiators will get down to business and crack some of these core issues, which we believe are in everyone's interest to deal with, not least the interests of uh, implementing in full the protocol on uh, Northern Ireland, because in many uh, ways, what we do in the future deal will have an impact on the types of checks and controls that may or may not be required when it comes to implementing the withdrawal agreement. So my thanks again for the opportunity and I look forward to both listening and sharing some ideas. Thank you very much, uh, Mairead. Uh, you've set it up very clearly there and I'm pleased to hand over to Lord Knoll. Thank you very much indeed and, um, and thank you, Mairead, for a, a typically clear uh, statement and I can agree with every word that you said as, as ever. And um, thank you, Suzanne, <coughs> for organising uh, today, I know it was a, quite a big slog, and um, Katie and Naomi, it's jolly nice to see you both, and thank you both as well. Uh, I'm going to cover four brief things uh, in a, a few minutes. First is some personal reflections on the uh, Northern Ireland Protocol itself. Secondly is the work of our committee. Thirdly is some views of the committee on the current situation. Uh, and fourthly is what matters now. But turning to the, the first of those things, of course, the protocol itself is a, a complex and subtle document, uh, but it, it consists of three bits. The first bit is uh, two pages of uh, recitals. Uh, I'll come back to in a second. Then there's 15 pages of articles, which are actually the legal guts of the, of the agreement. And then finally, there's 50 or so pages of the seven annexes which are really just lists of European laws that are be, to be respected uh, going forward. But the recitals are very interesting. They're always interesting in any European Union uh, document, in fact, because they do two things. They set a frame of mind for, having, for, for, for interpreting things, and they are aids to the interpretation of the articles that follow them. And I, my mind, my eyes were caught by the third recital, which says, recognizing that it is necessary to address the unique circumstances on the island of Ireland through a unique solution in order to ensure the orderly withdrawal of the United Kingdom from the Union. And I think that it is, uh, it is important uh, that we remember that those recitals are there. Of course, at the core of the, uh, of the, uh, protocol is the essential tension between articles 4, 5 and 6. Article 4, of course, is the one that uh, states that, that Northern Ireland is a part of the customs territory of the UK. And that's reinforced by Article 6, which says that nothing in the protocol will, and I quote, shall prevent the United Kingdom from ensuring unfettered access for goods moving from Northern Ireland to other parts of the United Kingdom's internal market. But they are offset by Article 5, which uh, <coughs> incorporates the entirety of EU customs legislation, including the Union Customs Code, uh, to Northern Ireland. And that essential tension, of course, is where the Joint Committee comes in. There are um, 19 articles which go into every aspect of Northern Ireland's existence. But there, there are 12 big areas where the Joint Committee is charged with trying to sort out matters. Uh, some of those are what I call monitoring and future adjustments, because, of course, the, uh, uh, the protocol is going to be, I think, a very long lasting thing. But there are a number of vital areas that need to be sorted out before the end of the transition period. And I'm not going to list them all, but in particular, for instance, there is the definition of good at risk. There are the 
the specifications of the arrangements over fish, and there are the specifications of the arrangements over agricultural support. So there are three things that I draw out of the, uh, the, uh, of the protocol. Firstly, is the importance of the risk titles in trying to interpret it. Secondly, is the essential tension between articles four, five, and six. And thirdly, is, is, the, is the broad activities and importance of the joint committee. Now, turning to the second of my things, our committee, of course, is 45 years old, and we are charged with uh, monitoring the whole of the relationship uh, of Britain with the European Union. And that uh, now also includes all the international agreements um, as well that, the, that Britain has. So that would include, for instance, us, or does include us, scrutinizing the negotiations between the UK and the USA over a, a future a trade agreement. Now, we have around 60 members uh, across all of our subcommittees. We have 19 on the main committee and 25 staff, and we have produced 45 reports or so uh, since the Brexit vote. Now, notice that the very first report we produced, which I've got here, which is my uh, copy, uh, in December 2016 was on UK-Irish relations. And the most recent uh, report, of course, we've been referred to already, is on the protocol, which was produced on the 1st of this month. I remember that Michael Jay, former head of our Foreign Office and long-term member of our committee who retired a couple of months ago, saying to me in December 2016 that this would be the first matter <coughs> that the committee reported on, that is the uh, uh, island of Ireland, and it will be the last one. And I have to say that I think that he was right wholly on that. Uh, moving on to our views on the current situation, of course we have just finished our report, so we're quite up to date. Uh, we in fact had an evidence session uh, with uh, business interests from the whole of the island of Ireland last week. Um, which was an update of uh, really our visit with more or less the same people uh, happened to be in Northern Ireland uh, in February. Um, we had, in fact, our Environment Subcommittee was uh, having a joint session with the Northern Ireland Assembly Subcommittee to talk about environmental issues and Brexit yesterday. Uh, and we have a general meeting with the Northern Ireland Assembly uh, next week. We would, of course, be much more active with Southern Ireland, but of course there have been electoral processes going on there, and I very much hope that uh, we will have a new government uh, to begin to uh, interact with uh, coming up shortly. The interesting thing most recently has been the British government's uh, white paper that came out on the 20th of last month. And um, that was interesting because it is expressed really substantially in the future tense. It is jam tomorrow. And interestingly, I wrote jam tomorrow on it one hour after I'd started reading it on the front page. I rang our chief clerk to find that he'd also written jam tomorrow on the front page of his copy as well. And now that we know there is no extension, the issues that, we're, that we felt to do with the urgency of beginning to address the detail of how things work in the future become day by day more urgent, which is a nice way of bringing me into feeling, well, what matters now? Of course, and in fact, we took evidence from Michel Barnier last week. It's very good to hear that uh, at the future negotiation level, there's going to be an intensification of efforts. And I, I'm sure we're all delighted to hear that. But in fact, what needs to happen on the protocol is a huge intensification of efforts to try and get all the various bits of the protocol working again. Remind, to remind you, there is the Joint Committee itself, there's the Specialised Committee on Northern Ireland, there's the Joint Consultative Working Group, which at least on the 20th of May had never met, and now there is now going to be a new business engagement forum uh, in Northern Ireland. Sorry, just one minute left. Apologies. So those things need to be, uh, need to be uh, uh, functioning. And, um, uh, and they need to think to begin to drip out decisions so that the people living in Northern Ireland actually begin to see that there is a future, that the businesses working in Northern Ireland can begin to see how they need to adapt for the new process.
Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Uh, 45 reports is extraordinarily impressive, um, and each one of them very comprehensive. Thank you very much for your remarks. And now over to um, Minister Naomi Long. Thanks, Katie. Um, and it's really good um, to see you all again this morning. Um, very unusual to be doing these things via web link, um, but it does have the added advantage that we get to speak to Maria without having to take long flights um, anymore, which is fantastic. Um, I just want to maybe reflect on a few things, um, just to make a few points, I suppose, to put this in, in the political context in Northern Ireland, because I think that there are challenges um, that are very specific to us um, that we need to be aware of as we move forward. I mean, the first thing I would say is that we're talking about Brexit and the impact on the island of Ireland. And I think we need to acknowledge the fact that when we talk about borders, whether that's in the Irish Sea or whether it's on the island of Ireland, we're not just talking about lights on a map. We are talking about cleavages in local politics that run very deep, that were the cause of conflict um, for many years, um, not just the most recent um, period of the Troubles. And I think that we need to understand fully the impact that every single practical consideration and every single practical discussion um, is overlaying with the sensitivities around the question of the border. Um, and our links with the UK and also our relationship um, with Ireland. And I think that there needs to be a recognition that that makes the practicalities of Brexit and working around all of these issues um, hugely sensitive. And we are a relatively new and fragile institution in our current form. And so I think the challenge there is great and shouldn't be underestimated. Um, so I just want to put it in that context um, in terms of the politics. Um, and the, the difficulties sometimes that we have in resolving what may seem um, on paper like relatively straightforward practical issues, but that can cause um, huge sensitivities and disquiet within communities. Um, the border winds its way through people's lives, through their daily lives and experiences. It winds its way through our politics. And it also has a huge impact on people's lived experience of the peace process here. And so I think it has to be treated with a degree of sensitivity, both in terms of our relationship uh, with GB uh, and also our relationship um, with Ireland. And the other point I want to raise is about COVID-19, um, because I think it has had a number of really significant impacts um, that are not necessarily being fully considered in all of this process. First of all, I think there's limited bandwidth in terms of government of being able to deal with the double challenge of Brexit in the midst of COVID crisis. And I think the result of that is that Brexit has been somewhat squeezed out. Um, to put it in context in terms of the assembly, uh, we had been having um, weekly dedicated meetings on the issue of Brexit um, until the COVID crisis. We have had two dedicated meetings dealing with Brexit um, since March. I think that's quite disturbing. It's not that we aren't dealing with Brexit papers as they come through the executive but we are not doing the kind of future planning that I think needs to be done if we are heading for a December deadline. But I think we also have to recognize that there is limited bandwidth for business, but businesses are now in a survival mode in Northern Ireland. Many of them will struggle to make it through the reopening phase and the relaxation phase um, of the COVID lockdown. And should we find ourselves in a situation where we have a second phase a second wave of COVID, I think some will, will definitely struggle. And so to ask businesses that are struggling um, to survive, to also deal with a mountain of bureaucracy, paperwork and future planning for Brexit, I think is quite an ask. Um, and I think that that is going to be hugely challenging because we're essentially, we recognise that Brexit would potentially be a, an economic shock, um, particularly in Northern Ireland, um, as opposed to other places. Um, but we now have also had this COVID economic shock. And so I think that by luring those two things together, it's an incredibly challenging time for business locally. We have a very integrated economy um, north-south, but we also are heavily reliant um, on our relationship um, east-west. And so the challenges of trying to maintain that balance, despite the fact that the, the government in the UK is taking a divergent path um, away from the kind of EU norms, I think is going to be a really complex um, issue for people in Northern Ireland as we try to manage that going forward. And I suppose the third thing that COVID has done is that it has negated a lot of the uh, planning that we had in place 
for loading because the world has shifted on its axis in the last few months and much of what we had planned to do if there was a sort of no deal outcome from Brexit um, really no longer applies because the, the context in which we're working is very different. And yet government are not in the situation of having an Operation Yellowhammer or whatever it might be to plan for no deal because they won't countenance the idea that there may be no deal. So I think that's a challenge um, for us at the moment in terms of how we split our resources between preparing um, for a deal, which we don't know the shape of, and trying to also mitigate against the effects of no deal. Third thing I want to say is that I think we're in a sort of a denial phase when it comes to Brexit, and I don't only mean at the Assembly. I think there's a denial phase in government about um, how difficult it will be to get a deal through. Um, I think Red has set out very clearly that there are processes in the European Union um, we use grind slowly. Um, and I, as a former MEP, am conscious um, that the deadline is actually much earlier in practice than it is on paper. Um, and I think that that's not fully recognised because Parliament is much more agile um, at being able to force things through at short notice and very quickly without the kind of approach um, that would tend to happen within the European Union. And so I think that there is a, still a sense that if we can put something out of the bag um, in the late hours of the 31st of December, everything will be fine. And I think people need to be rapidly disabused of that notion. But I also think that there is a degree of denial here in Northern Ireland about what the protocol will actually mean. I think we saw that very clearly in some of the questioning of the Prime Minister in Parliament this week, uh, where people still are in denial about the need for checks um, when people come across from GB on goods that are arriving in Northern Ireland. Um, but there's also, I think, a little bit of a denial just about the reality of the challenge that faces us. And I, I thought it might be useful just to, in terms of the capacity challenge, um, just set out what it will require of the Assembly, um, we think, in the next um, few months. In order to prepare for the protocol, which some ministers, I think, would still like to tell us we don't have to prepare for, but we do, we will have to pass um, 115 Assembly statutory rules, but we will also have to pass 208 Westminster statutory instruments through the Assembly, and that will require scrutiny by committees, and it will require time in the Chamber. And I have to say, I think that is a that is a very uh, tall order, given that we're also dealing with the backlog um, of legislation from when the Assembly was suspended for three years. So I think there are genuine capacity issues um, when it comes to how the Assembly will be able um, to progress these issues um, going forward. The final issue that I want to raise um, is that of the communications between um, the executive and um, the UK government. And I think whilst um, the Welsh and Scottish governments have been very robust um, in their responses, they have essentially set aside the internal debate about Brexit, good or bad, have set that to the side and have focused entirely on the practicalities of things. I think here we are still struggling to find unity of voice and purpose um, because, for example, when we felt that we should write to um, the government and seek an extension, in order to give us more time to do the work that is required, it's split very much in the pro-Brexit, anti-Brexit camp, as opposed to the practical issue of can we actually be prepared, can business be prepared in the time available. And I think that schism runs much more deeply in Northern Ireland politics because it aligns both circle to come back to the beginning uh, with the divide that we have in politics in Northern Ireland when it comes to the Irish border. And I think that that runs very deep and is going to be an additional challenge um, for us in terms of even dealing with what are basic practicalities. So uh, those are my kind of initial thoughts and I'm happy then obviously to get into the discussion further. Thank you. Thank you very much, Naomi, and thanks to each of you for your comments. Um, I wonder just to, to begin discussion um, um, amongst the panel, whether you might be willing to reflect a little bit on the process of withdrawal itself um, and the experience of that uh, with regards to your respective institutions. Um, so although, of course, Brexit, um, to some degree, reportedly focused on the sovereignty of the UK Parliament and a lot of focus on the House of Commons in particular, um, uh, all institutions, and especially in how the Northern Ireland Assembly is back, are directly affected and were directly affected by the process of withdrawal. And I was just wondering if you might reflect a little bit on the constraints and also the opportunities that your institutions experience, not just in relation to scrutiny and democratic process, but also the public facing 
role um, of your institutions. And I wonder if I could uh, begin by asking that of you, Mairead. Yeah, I think it's been really important that all of the institutions um, constantly speak about what's going on. And I think to Charles's point around the, um, the, if you like, the conundrum about how you implement something that sounds so simple but is so extraordinarily complex, the Northern Ireland Protocol, we need a deep discussion and debate. And what was quite interesting after um, the referendum of the United Kingdom, when we didn't have an assembly in Northern Ireland, how significant that was for those stakeholders, citizens, businesses who needed to communicate their concerns. They didn't have a platform to do that. So the absence of the institution really left a gap uh, at that particular time. So we all very much welcome that the Assembly is back up and running. I think that's absolutely vital. What's also vital in these times um, are these events, but equally the, the, the private exchanges, the times when parliaments meet. So this morning I spoke to the chairs of the European Affairs Committee across Europe and we listened to each other. Um, I've been able at COSAC to meet with uh, Charles uh, and other colleagues. And while we have our formal conversations, we also have time for a coffee. And I think those are particularly important times. For the European Parliament here, I think our engagement on Brexit has been very transparent. Some of the more lively, fiery and indeed depressing debates on Brexit, both before it happened and afterwards, have taken place um, on the floor of our House and some of the most difficult debates I've been chairing them. So we've felt it in many ways and have tried to assist in this process while still regretting that it is happening. We're trying to assist in every way to make sure that the politics and the institutions and the commitments um, in terms of legal uh, commitments in the withdrawal agreement and the political declaration which pinpoints the future are kept together and that we remind each other of all of our duties and obligations. I think the other um, issue that I would feel from my side as I represent those counties along the invisible border and lived in County Louth as, as a young person and slightly older now in County Meath is that I think all of us have the backstory of, of uh, the troubles in Northern in Ireland. And again, we need um, to get us all to understand how difficult it was to build peace. And that while Brexit is a political decision um, through referendum, that fundamentally, and even in this morning's exchanges, uh, everyone spoke about the importance of peace and that all of the institutions need to work hard uh, to make sure that we build on that process. And even if it is difficult and complex, that we do it in a very considered way. Where I would share the concern that Charles raised is that thus far, I think there are more questions um, from Northern Ireland, from business and from everybody in politics as to what exactly is going to be required of them on January the 1st. And there's no point in them knowing that, <coughs> excuse me, in December, <coughs> they need to know that way before. And I think that maybe this conversation can help, if you like, jolt um, a reality check here, that in order for business that is devastated by the pandemic, as Naomi Long has referenced, and who also had been preparing to some extent for Brexit, but not sure in which type, they're now going to have to roll up their sleeves again and go back to the drawing board to see how they can plan. But I think it's very difficult for them to do that. So all of our political institutions, I think, need to work together, both in, at the public level and indeed in the meetings we have privately as elected representatives. And I have to say that one of the regrets I would have um, around Brexit is the idea that we may not have those informal um, opportunities as well as the formal and that we have to rebuild structures to make sure that that continues. Because even though um, we thought that the first phase withdrawal agreement once was reached, that was that bit over and we hope the next bit will be over, I don't think Brexit will ever be complete in that um, whatever comes of these next few weeks and months there will be other things to discuss with our friends in the United Kingdom and therefore links will have to be maintained and strengthened um, and perhaps new ones formed in order for our institutions to work effectively and for the political, uh, if you like, space to make sure that these issues are dealt with. Um, and again to Naomi's point about um, the, what the pandemic has caused, to some extent I've been heartened in a way that um, public health was above politics and I think some of the, you know, exchange 
changes within the Assembly because we were prioritising public health, pulled away from perhaps some of the political differences, though clearly they are still there when we look at the vote on the resolution in the Assembly to extend the deadline. So we're all aware of the sensitivities and aware of our duties and are trying in our different ways through our institutions to make sure that we have continuity um, because beyond this year we are going to have to have that. Um, and indeed on some of the bigger issues apart from trade uh, and rules and those things that we are concerned about, um, you know, uh, connections with the UK around security, uh, judicial issues is also very important to us. Um, and while some progress might be made, I think there are issues where they're not even on the table yet. So yes, I think we do as institutions have to find ways to communicate. Um, it's interesting that we can use this technology today because of health reasons, and maybe we can use it better in the future in order for us to know and understand. And one of the things that I have felt truly sorry for from the point of view of my engagement with um, people in Northern Ireland in business and in, in, in society generally, is their sense of being voiceless at the early stages of Brexit. And I'm very glad now that we have politicians like Naomi and the Assembly can function, although it is of concern when she says that they've only had two meetings, particularly on Brexit. I think that will have to, if you like, um, spur up a little in order for those questions to be addressed to the satisfaction of businesses who are, you know, in limited resources because of the pandemic, trying to re-establish their business and also trying to put aside some reserves to cope with um, whatever comes. And my final comment is that whatever comes comes changes on its way. And I think that's the most important message we need to get across, um, that regardless of the protocol, which is a very unique construct and indeed a complex one, uh, that even with that, there will be change um, as to how business operates. And clearly what business would like today is certainty around that change because it's something that they don't have now. So this lack of time, lack of uh, info and lack of engagement, which is referenced in the report from the House of Lords, is, is still there and it's still a big problem. Thank you very much, Reid. Um, I'll hand over to you now, Charles, for your comments. Thank you very much indeed. Well, uh, I've uh, listed a few things out here. The first is I've written down is scrutiny gap. Uh, and that is that we had very good uh, scrutiny arrangements in place uh, before all of Brexit. Uh, and But we don't have good scrutiny in place uh, now, uh, for instance, on the joint committees. And um, uh, Mairead's uh, European Parliament colleagues and Mairead herself uh, came up with the inventive suggestion that in fact there's joint scrutiny arranged uh, with the European Parliament and the UK Parliament uh, to try and do that. And um, I remember talking to Mairead about this in January. We are extremely keen on that as an idea and think it's a hugely inventive idea. But the scrutiny gap has got to be filled somehow because the Joint Committee structure uh, there may be other joint committees added in the future negotiations, is going to be incredibly important for all our nations. And, um, uh, and so we have to address the scrutiny gap, and we're spending quite a bit of time on our committee cons considering how that is done and in discussions with government um, as well. Secondly, has been this is in fact driven considerably greater levels of interparliamentary work just as Mairead was saying, it's, I, I find the COSAC meetings incredibly helpful in terms of finding from other uh, chairs of European Affairs Committees what is going on in their countries. We have significant additional numbers of bilateral discussions uh, these days and, 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 and it is driving a difference in our behaviour and indeed the terms of reference of the European Union Committee in the House of Lords was updated a couple of months ago and now specifically refers to that as being one of our tasks in life. A third uh, thing of four is that we are very bad at communicating, that we do quite a bit of work um, and we write reports, but uh, we're now making considerably more effort in terms of trying to communicate what we're finding so that it's not drowned out by um, people who are trying not to have, as it were, the searchlight aimed at what's really going on, uh, um, uh, sort of successfully tell people. So we are going to have to be better uh, as a chamber and better, in fact, as a whole parliament at communicating what, as committees, we find out and we are, we are working at that. But I finished by saying that, um, of course, the remarkable thing of the, of the of Northern Ireland Protocol is 
the symmetry between that, between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, the island of Ireland, and the EU itself. The EU was a peace project. And the Belfast Agreement is a, is a, is a peace project of a different uh, nature. And so there is, it, it's in everyone's interest, it's everyone's DNA, to try and make sure that the protocol, which is really prolonging a, a peace project, can be successfully implemented. And, um, uh, but I, I take, actually, I'm optimistic about things being solved because I believe it's in the DNA of everyone sitting around the table that they want the thing prolonged because it is, it is such a key part of, of what we've been doing in Western Europe for many decades. I'm optimistic, but I, I do recognize there's a lot of hard yards to go. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Charles. And um, uh, just in terms of the communication from your um, from the Lord's EU committee, I would highly recommend that people follow you on Twitter. You're making valiant efforts with regards to Twitter threats. <laughs> very well. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that there are a few things that I want to touch on, but I'm going to pick up something that's literally just been said, and that is about um, Europe as, if you like, a peace project and um, the impact of all of this on the Northern Ireland peace process. Um, first of all, I would underestimate the impact that it's had, um, but some of that has been positive. So, for example, on the issue of Brexit, whilst, as I said, the political, party political lines are still very firmly drawn along the old dynamics, um, unionist versus nationalist, um, when it comes to the Brexit debate. In terms of society, that's not the case. So we've seen a massive move away from those traditional alignments. Um, and my own party has benefited hugely, I think, from the fact that people have moved away. And Brexit was one of the factors that forced people to reevaluate, if you like, their loyalty to particular um, kind of party political allegiances um, because they were challenged by what Brexit might mean um, for them and for their community and, and for society. And so there are opportunities in that for us to rise above um, the kind of old um, sectarian landscape and do things differently. Um, I would never emphasize it, I would never estimate it in terms of the impact that it's had on politics to date, but I certainly think that there are opportunities there in terms of some transformation down the line, and that may be a positive, and sometimes it takes a crisis um, to drive people to reevaluate what actually matters to them. Um, and thankfully, one of the things that really mattered to them was European cooperation and that wider project. Um, I also think, if I may say, that the Northern Ireland peace process is surprisingly much better understood um, and much more sensitively addressed in the EU um, than I find it to be in Westminster. So as having sat in both places, I needed to explain the peace process um, a lot less to my European counterparts um, than to fellow MPs. Um, they were aware of the peace process, but they saw it as a job done not as an ongoing process. Um, and I think at times lacked sensitivity in the approach that was taken. Um, I also would have to be honest and say that at times the way some MPs have referred to um, their counterparts in, in, in the South um, in a kind of a slightly pejorative, but certainly patronizing fashion um, rather than respecting them as an independent nation has been hugely unhelpful in terms of um, respect and dignity in terms of how we take these conversations forward. So I think there are real challenges around all of this. I think that um, we don't see the same sensitivity, sadly, um, from the UK government to the peace process um, as we would from the EU and indeed um, from the Irish government, um, who I think have invested much more personally in this and feel more connected to it in some ways um, than, for example, the current government might and um, just given that they weren't around at the time when um, the, the Good Friday Agreement was signed and through much of the change that happened. Um, so I think that's unfortunate, but I think that's something we just need to work through. In terms of a voice for business, uh, in terms of the Assembly, I think that's absolutely correct. And I think Maria will, will appreciate um, people felt very frustrated, particularly at a time when there was no Assembly, but a large number of pro Brexit MPs from Northern Ireland in Parliament and therefore they felt their voice was not being heard at all and I think that that resulted in, in quite dramatic changes in terms of the electoral landscape. 
However, I think people will increasingly become frustrated if they feel that those they've elected to the assembly are not reflecting their concerns because they're more driven by dogma than they are by the practicalities of um, trying to address the challenges that businesses face. And so I think that where we can set aside the discussions around Brexit and the protocol at the political level and the practical ways of assisting business, um, I think that that's, that's important that we do that. But it, I would have to note uh, some caution because my experience in the executive has been that it's been quite difficult to do that um, and to get people to step away from their kind of traditional view um, around Brexit in order um, to, to make progress. Um, I think in terms of um, where I suppose the communications are difficult, I do think because we don't have a single voice single position in the executive where we do we can articulate that clearly um, but I think on the protocol in particular there is a tendency for those who were pro-Brexit um, to blame the challenges we face on the protocol where those who were opposed to Brexit clearly lay the blame for the problems that we're facing with at, the, at the feet of Brexit itself and so even that dynamic is making it quite difficult because I believe we have to implement the protocol but there seems to be some ambiguity in language coming from Westminster at times, particularly from the Prime Minister um, and, and his aides around whether or not the protocol needs to be implemented in full and what that actually looks like. And I think it's very difficult for us as an assembly um, and as an executive to be able to deliver on something whilst there is still this false narrative being peddled um, politically um, that these things don't need to happen. And so I think the sooner we all kind of get down to the reality, to the nitty gritty, to the planning and organisation, the better it will be. And the sooner we accept the reality of the protocol and start to implement it, the better. I think the real challenge, and I think Maria um, said it out very clearly, is that the longer it takes for a, a final deal to be done or indeed not done, um, the longer it will be before we know exactly what will be required of business and are in a position to give them advice. And so I, my fear is that if the negotiations don't reach a conclusion quickly, that we will not have time to prepare as a government for what's going to happen, but we will also lack the time to prepare businesses for what is going to happen next. And I think that that is worrying because there seems to be some belief that the transition itself uh, will not end um, at the end of the year. Um, there seems to be some belief that there will be some kind of phased um, approach to all of this. I keep referring people back to the fact that if you want um, slower, a slower approach, you need to ask for the extension, um, and that hasn't happened. So I think there are real challenges, um, but I do think there are also opportunities in terms of people in Northern Ireland actually coming together at ground, at grassroots level, um, and working on issues in a way that perhaps we haven't seen before. I also think, just in, in conclusion on this particular question, there has been a recognition that Northern Ireland is in a different place to the rest of the UK on quite a number of things, not least of all um, when it comes to the fact that our economy is, is weaker um, as a starting point, but also I think um, reflecting the need for immigration and the differential in our needs for immigration um, and the, perhaps some other parts of the UK. And I think that there is a real challenge now um, to find out how we can ensure that the regional, um, the regionalization that we're seeing with devolution is also reflected in how we actually plan for the future in terms of business um, and in terms of support for business. Because realistically, I think that it's those bigger ticket issues that are reserve matters. So things like immigration um, and so on, that will be absolutely vital in terms of Northern Ireland business, either being able to survive this or not. Thank you very much, uh, Naomi. Thank you uh, to all of you for your uh, comments. Um, I was very struck by your phrase, Charles, when you talked about the protocol prolonging the peace process, um, which is a big ask of any document. Um, uh, and it's a, obviously we're conscious that it might be perceived that the legitimacy of the protocol is, is, is uh, somewhat in question, given the context of it, with some, you know, obviously many people in Northern Ireland not wanting Brexit and then other people, or, and sometimes the same people too, um, being very concerned about the impact of the protocol. So we're in really tricky grounds, and, um, but the protocol is there 
fundamentally to protect the Good Friday Agreement. So I think I'm going to bring together some questions that are coming through now from uh, members of the audience in relation to protecting the peace process and the challenges that entails. Um, and there are specific things to ask in this regard. One is whether there is anything that, uh, and by the way, um, uh, pick up any of this or um, as you wish, um, rather than trying to answer all of it, but is there any legislative mechanism or anything in particular that uh, any institution, be it the UK or the EU, could do, or even uh, the Irish government might be able to do, that you think would be significant, or uh, a small contribution perhaps towards protecting the peace process. And also in relation to, um, to that sort of relationship between the legislators, um, so uh, between, say, for example, the Northern Ireland Assembly and the European Parliament, are there formal or informal uh, things that might be done to make a difference? And uh, Charles, you mentioned the Joint Committee. Are there, are there things that it would be useful, do you think, from Northern Ireland for, um, for the Northern Ireland Assembly to, or Executive to be um, asking uh, with regards to representation? So, or maybe there's something else entirely that you think would be really key to the peace process um, that I've missed there. Um, so I will look at who would like to answer first on that. Mairead, over to you. If I may just come in um, to say that one of the things we haven't mentioned at all is the reason why we have this complicated protocol, which is a, particularly about the peace process and no hard border, because that's the, the, what we've all been working hard to avoid but also protecting the single market. And that's why it becomes particularly complicated. So there is no doubt that across this parliament and across the member states, everyone is aware of the history of Northern Ireland and the island of Ireland, all of those issues, because they have made it their business to find out. And I think that's been really heartening. Uh, but equally, they would have concerns about uh, their own marketplace and the protection of the EU single market. And that's why clarification uh, from the UK side about, you know, what are they preparing in terms of uh, informing businesses of checks that will uh, be required and how they will be done. And we really do need to see progress on that. So it's, it's, it's a two-sided issue. When you ask then about the institutions and what we can do, I mean, clearly, um, you know, one of the things I regret, and I suppose it's not to the future, it's to the past, is that when I came here in 2004, I had the wisdom of Jim Nicholson. Um, I met with Diane Dodds. We were both on a committee together. We would agree and we would disagree. But my goodness, being able to talk to each other meant that there were fewer differences and there was much more in common. And we will miss that engagement. And I think we're going to have to find a way to replace that. So whatever I think, um, with the Parliament is very open to always engaging, whether we do that in a structured way. Um, and while our resolution did, as, as Charles mentioned, suggest this, if you like, uh, parliamentary assembly, uh, there's been very little progress made on that thus far. And I think those of us who are interested in it need to make sure that that happens. I sometimes um, worry that maybe the, the political line of the UK wanting to be sovereign and independent may stray into us, you know, not being able to keep together in the way we are, where I think lots of us realise that in this world, you know, nobody can solve all their problems alone. And that parliamentary colleagues talking to each other is really positive. And then maybe just to say about the future with, uh, you know, ourselves in, in Ireland, I mean, clearly there is a new programme for government. I think votes have been counted even as I speak. I'm not getting any messages, so I can't tell you what's happening. But it is a very monumental day, a monumentous day in Ireland because of what's happening. We do hope a new government will be formed. I and mean, as you know, it's, it will be three parties. And in the document, or, you know, there is a particular chapter in the programme for government on, you know, the island of Ireland, the shared issues, if you like. And I think a determination in that to make sure that we use all of the mechanisms available in the Good Friday Agreement um, and use them to the best possible way. And frankly, I think Brexit probably was a wake-up call for all of us and a wake-up call around the Good Friday Agreement that perhaps we weren't doing enough to fortify um, the, the agreement and making sure that we were working to, you know, strengthen in communities to make sure that the policies we were implementing here in the EU and the way we were funding them were assisting community development because this is not an overnight process. It's an over time, it's an over generational process. So I think you will see um, if everything goes uh, as we, we hope in government formation, you, I think you will see a very strong focus uh, in the new government 
towards maximising our connections around the Good Friday Agreement. And I think I'd have to mention uh, Thonish to Simon Coveney and his relationship with Julian Smith, which was so strong and so effective. And I would say, despite all of the other pressures on uh, Minister Coveney, I mean, he gave it all to try and help in terms of restoring the Assembly. Um, and I think that that commitment will remain. And I think it can only be strengthened. And, and perhaps when there is a settlement around ministerial positions, uh, that there will be a focus on this uh, reality that we don't know what's going to happen in terms of how the protocol will be, be implemented. We know that we don't want it to have any negative impact between communities and there are still tensions there. Um, and, you know, that will be helpful. So I, I'm, I'm quite positive in relation to what we can do. The European Parliament stands ready to do that. Um, I was very impressed this morning amongst the colleagues from around the European Union. They all referenced the, the Irish issue. So there's no doubt about the level of engagement and concern. Um, it's how you translate that into practical application. And I suppose this is the key point. When there was a deal made effectively between the Taoiseach, Leo Varadkar, and the British Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, which solved this conundrum of um, the island of Ireland and no hard border, it was a skeleton. And there's still very little flesh on the bones of that skeleton. And I think that that's why this conversation is so important, to perhaps understand what is needed so that people can plan and prepare and equally um, put gentle but effective pressure on the negotiators to make sure that the future relationship minimises the changes that will be made. Although having said that, when you listen to uh, what the British Prime Minister speaks of, it is a, a Brexit of divergence. Um, and that is likely to intensify after 2020 and we will need to understand the implications of that greater divergence around how the protocol in Northern Ireland is implemented. So I think as Charles said it, it isn't just scrutiny now, I think it's scrutiny almost for, for the long term. Absolutely, thank you very much. That's a, a good analogy too about the skeleton I think of the protocol and it explains a lot as to why we are where we are at the moment. Thank you. And um, Charles? Thank you very much indeed. And uh, yet again, I find myself agreeing heavily with um, Mairead. And um, thank you uh, for reminding us as well about the importance of protecting the EU single market. And there is also the UK single market, which is, is protected as well. So it's a very complicated thing to do um, all round. I want to just go back and stress again the importance of scrutinising the Joint Committee and the Specialised Committee on, on Northern Ireland. And because this is the committee which has been set up to solve all these problems. And at the moment, there is no formal scrutiny process so that the parliamentarians concerned, so that is at the, the, at the Northern Ireland Assembly level, at the Westminster level, at the European Parliament level, uh, actually we're not getting the automated look-in as to how the, that uh, uh, joint committee structure is working. And that's incredibly important because if it starts going off the rails, there's no method of us discovering that nice and early. And um, the key thing is to, is, is, I think, to build a proper and proportionate scrutiny structure on that. Um, and uh, and Mairead and her colleagues are very focused on that. And I say again how appreciative we are of, the, of the, what is now at least two uh, uh, resolutions that have been adopted on the point, and we're very supportive of that all round. In terms of um, the involvement of the Northern Ireland Assembly, Northern Ireland government in things, that's, it is actually set out uh, how they get involved in the whole withdrawal agreement package. And uh, I think we have to see how that works a bit to see whether or not that is proportionate and correct. And if it's not, then I hope that the withdrawal agreement mechanism, which allows for small changes and the first small changes have even been agreed between the parties in the last few weeks, uh, would allow for changes in that, which I think would strengthen it. But in terms of the structures that I think are, are needed, we have something called the Interparliamentary Forum on Brexit, uh, which was started by the uh, Lords Committee, which in includes all of the devolved administrations in the UK. And we meet regularly in order to start talking about some of these issues. And Northern Ireland, the Northern Ireland Assembly, of course, is, is back in the fold there for the first time. And that is one uh, mechanism for making sure that things are right. There's also the British Irish Parliamentary Assembly, which is another um, mechanism 
for ensuring um, that things are right. And the, that is powered by officials from our own committee structure. And we very much believe in that. I'm struck again by the incredibly wise Michael Jay, who did say that the most important uh, meeting that ever took place in the margins of any EU uh, summit was always the discussion between the British Prime Minister and the Taoiseach. And, and that at the moment, of course, there's no real method for those two individuals to ever have a, a, a private mini chat. And so I do think that one thing that needs to be set up is a mechanism for um, uh, intergovernmental relations between the UK and, um, and the EU. And I, I, that hasn't been thought of yet. It's, it's not really forming part of the future negotiation discussions. It's a detail for the future, but it must be set up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Charles. I mean, I noticed in the draft, still draft programme for government in the South, there is some intention of uh, recreating those relations between Britain and Ireland is informal. You're absolutely right, the UK EU dimension is still um, very much unclear. Naomi, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think we should underestimate just how important those informal um, relationships were in terms of Ireland and the UK joining the EU, engaging in the EU, and the pressure that that brought to bear on all parties to try to resolve the historic differences between London and Dublin. And until those differences were resolved, until relationships there were normalised between the two nation states, it was always going to be almost impossible to pursue any kind of peace process in Northern Ireland, which was disputed territory. So I, I don't think any of us should underestimate when people say to me, well, you know, the Good Friday Agreement wasn't really an EU project. Well, actually, in essence, it was because it was the EU and joint membership collaboration and relationship building through the EU that built the foundations on which the peace process was then able to be nurtured into existence. And indeed, it was the EU and the programme funds um, and the peace monies that came to Northern Ireland that then kind of sustained it over um, that period. But more than that, fundamental to the Good Friday Agreement um, is the direction of travel of the EU, which was to move towards much more um, collaboration, cooperation and alignment and to make borders less and less important. And so if you have a border dispute, one way of resolving the dispute is to minimize the impact of the border on everyday life and people's lived experience. And that was a very effective means in terms of the Good Friday Agreement, um, where people were essentially able to live their lives as EU citizens on both sides of the border without impediment um, to trade, to travel um, or anything else. And I think that that joined upness around um, the EU actually diminished the importance of borders and allowed things like the common travel area to come into the fore um, and I think really was very effective in terms of underpinning the peace process. I do have to say it's slightly ironic that in this conversation we're talking about how we can find ways of communication, cooperation, collaboration and you do kind of at times feel like saying it's a pity a big organisation like that doesn't exist somewhere where people could come together and work on these things. Um, we are always, I think, at the disadvantage that the EU already does all of these things very, very well um, and that whatever we put in place is suboptimal and I have found that with a lot of the things that I've been dealing with in justice, we have been able to find replacements and mechanisms and I think within the security sphere there's more flexibility um, because people are aligned in terms of their desire, um, their desired outcomes so it's been easier in some ways to progress those issues. But all of those solutions, when they're assessed against what we had before through the EU membership that we had, are suboptimal. They are more clunky, they are more expensive to run, they are more awkward um, to operate in real time. And so I, I think that the same will be true of communication, which is why it's so important um, that what came, if you like, casually and naturally um, as members of the EU, um, in the same way that and Parliament people in the voting lobbies could have quick chats that could be influential on different issues, the same way that around the fringes of the EU people would meet from different parties and have those conversations. Those incidental conversations now need to be structured and that's difficult because sometimes the value of those conversations is that they're unstructured, unminuted, unrecorded um, and they're about relationship building. 
So I think trying to focus on communication is going to be the big issue. And I would agree entirely with the issue about the Taoiseach um, and the, the Prime Minister having that ongoing communication. I mean, the shared interests in these islands are enormous and go way beyond um, any, I think probably any other region in the EU in terms of our interconnectedness, um, in terms of trade and our economy um, and our future. And I think that it's really important that there is a mutually respectful um, engagement um, as equals on, on, on these issues between the Prime Minister and the Taoiseach, because I think if that doesn't happen, things will very rapidly um, unravel in terms of the Northern Ireland peace process, because I think parties locally will take their leadership um, largely from the tone of the relationship um, between London and Dublin, and that has been the history of the peace process. So I think if there's one thing that we can do to underpin the peace process, um, one really useful thing, it is to find a structure um, where that engagement between London and Dublin continues to be um, ongoing, um, intimate, um, consistent, um, and respectful, because I think it's when that starts to fray at the edges that we see tensions then rise in the community and in politics in Northern Ireland. I also think that um, it's important that the EU continues with the interest that it has shown in Northern Ireland. I mean, I, I referenced already um, the, the huge kind of understanding. I mean, the, U, the UK is strange, I suppose GB is strange in that it doesn't have a, a land border anywhere else other than in Northern Ireland. So um, perhaps has a slightly different relationship in terms of sovereignty and its sense of independence. I think a lot of EU nations understand sensitivities around borders, shifting borders, people's sense of allegiance and, and, and identity and how those are intertwined and had a much more natural fee perhaps um, for some of those challenges. Um, I think it's really important that they maintain that level of interest in what happens in Northern Ireland um, in, in terms uh, of sustaining the process, but also I think in terms of you know trying to facilitate that cooperation and collaboration um, between the UK and Irish government because I think of all of the things that is absolutely key and I think that that would be hugely helped um, by the EU having a presence in Northern Ireland. I know that's been controversial, the government has said it's not necessary um, and so on but I, I believe that having a presence here particularly um, when the EU continues um, to invest funds in Northern Ireland um, in terms of Peace Plus and other things, I think it's a completely sensible and responsible thing to do. And I think it would be hugely helpful as potentially creating the kind of space that Maria has mentioned, uh, where politicians from different backgrounds, from different parties, from different parts of these islands would be able to interface and talk about the issues as we go forward. And as our relationship develops, because whatever future relationship is agreed at the end of this year, and I hope one is agreed, that relationship will inevitably, as everything else does, evolve and change over time. And so we need to remain connected. And I think perhaps where Northern Ireland could have an opportunity in all of this is to be the connection between the UK um, and the EU um, and to be the platform of where people can meet, have those conversations and discussions um, because we have particularly unique experience of having one foot in each camp. And I think that uh, an office um, in Belfast, um, or indeed in some of our other um, cities, would actually make a huge difference um, in terms of being able to offer that space um, for engagement. Thank you very much, Naomi. That's a really uh, positive um, conclusion. So we've got about um, 10 minutes or so left of, our, of the panel discussion. Um, and there are a lot of questions coming through that are quite big. <laughs> um, but I think, uh, so I'll just, I'll just mention some of them, and I think one fundamental uh, issue is, of course, the fact that there remains these, these tensions and disagreements about what the protocol actually means, and um, I mean, the, the question of the EU's presence in Northern Ireland has been um, highlighted even after the recent uh, Joint Committee meeting as an issue over which uh, the two uh, have to uh, find some kind of agreement um, and solution by the end of this year. Um, and what is your sense of the fact that still, even in Parliament, we're hearing uh, this idea that um, in the UK Parliament that there will be no uh, checks and control, there won't be physical infrastructure, and if, if this question of, say, 
uh, exit summary declarations from Northern Ireland that uh, we have to ask Michel Barnier about that. You know, this sort of, this, the, the fact that it's still in the realms of drama. And I wonder whether, I guess there's two possible outcomes to this. One is that um, there will be fundamental um, tensions and they will never resolve those issues by the end of this year. And what, if that was the case, what would you think would be the consequences of that? Or indeed, they will be quietly resolved, but perhaps not satisfactorily resolved. Um, so there will be some kind of fudge or compromise, but maybe uh, maybe that's not done clearly or in a sort of transparent way or an effective way. Um, if you see what I'm, there's a, there's a slight difference there. So what would you think might be the consequences of either of those kind of outcomes? Or maybe there's a different outcome. Yeah, can, can, can I maybe come in on this one, Katie, just very briefly? Um, I think there are two aspects to this. I think, first of all, if we if we continue with the delusion um, that this doesn't require checks, that it doesn't require um, the kind of infrastructure that it clearly does, then I think we run the risk of not being prepared when it comes um, to the end of this year. And I think that that leads many of our businesses um, in a very difficult position um, in terms of their ability to be able um, to take forward uh, the, the business that they have to do. I think businesses do want to trade in uncertainty, um, but more than that, I think we need to create a culture of compliance from the outset. And I say this with a very strong focus as Justice Minister. Um, we have a certain group of entrepreneurs in this community who are very good at exploiting loopholes in the law um, in terms of of organized crime um, in terms of smuggling um, and other things and we know that much of that money then ends up getting invested um, in paramilitary and, uh, and terrorist organizations and so I think it is hugely important that we are clear about what business has to do that we make it as simple and straightforward as possible and that we encourage a culture of compliance from the beginning because if we lose that we will have businesses who default on their obligations through lack of knowledge we will have businesses who find the whole thing so burdensome that they simply ignore it. And we will have others who deliberately exploit the uncertainty and non-compliance um, in order to conduct their business in an illegal manner. And I think if we do that, it is hugely damaging um, to the culture of lawfulness that we're trying to inject into um, Northern Ireland society in general. So I think that the implications of not being honest about this and not being prepared are enormous um, in terms of society. I also think that there are costs incurred here that we need to be realistic about. If we want, um, for example, our courts um, and our other businesses to be ready for this, we need to give them advance notice so that they can make the kind of changes and plans that are required. And that means getting certainty as early as possible um, in, in, in this part of the year um, so that they can make those plans. Because I think what business cannot cope with is a constantly movable feast so that they don't know from one day to the next what is being demanded of them. I don't think it's reasonable to do that, but I think that that needs leadership at the top because I have to say, when we try to discuss these issues at executive level, what we find is people referring to what Boris Johnston has said or what a minister has said at the dispatch box in Westminster, which is often entirely contrary to the text, the legal text that has been agreed in the protocol and the political declaration and the withdrawal agreement, and we keep having to return to this debate as to what does it mean. Um, Michelle Barnier will say one thing, um, Boris Johnson will say another, um, and so we are then in a space where, you know, it, it has been quite difficult to get people to accept what needs to be done. We actually, on a, a number of occasions, have asked for legal advice ourselves um, on what it means so that we're absolutely clear that if ministers choose not to implement it, they're doing so with full knowledge that, that they are they're abrogating their responsibilities. So I think that th this is going to be challenging, but I think the longer the narrative, the kind of fantasy narrative around this continues, the more damage we're going to do to business and actually the, the more risk we're placing in terms of justice and security um, around an instability um, at the end of the year. Thank you very much, Naomi. Um, Mary, uh, who wants to come in next? 
Um, j just on that point, I mean, intuitively, one would think that the United Kingdom would be pushing for this big framework agreement with the European Union in order that the words said in the House of Commons occasionally mean that there is very little change in Northern Ireland. I mean, that just is intuitively the case. However, um, what is also politically being said is that this divergence will happen over time. I mean, I, I think that a lot of business people will hear what's being said uh, perhaps in many chambers, but actually we'll look at the reality because this situation is not um, and cannot be hidden. So the idea of us, you know, you know, doing something but nobody will know uh, isn't just real because goods are physical and will need to be checked in certain cases and there will need to be extra documentation and you cannot get away from that fact. And the reason why we don't have those checks and obligations today is because the United Kingdom is in a transition out of the European Union and enjoys the benefits of being within. Um, so, I mean, there are challenges for the United Kingdom in these next weeks and months to, if they want little disruption in Northern Ireland, then really work very hard and come to an agreement with us in the European Union around a very strong, comprehensive future relationship. Um, but the idea of trying to, you know, sort it somewhere quietly, I don't think that's real at all. And I think it doesn't help those businesses and individuals, the people at the port who are getting letters uh, recently um, and getting mixed messages from the letter and the word. I mean, they know the change is coming and the sooner they know what exactly they need to do, the better. So I hope that that will be what will prevail. Um, I mean, the questions I get asked is, um, you know, around, you know, rules of origin. Um, I mean, the, from an island of Ireland, if we come back to this theme here, we haven't even mentioned environmental issues because rivers flow and, you know, there's no border with a river. And all of these things that are important to us for the future around climate and biodiversity, you know, on a shared island, we need to work together on those. So that's one other reason why we will need to strengthen our cooperation because air quality doesn't stop where the invisible border starts. Um, so I think on so many other issues, we're going to have to work really well together. Um, but it is back to that point of what exactly um, do the two sides want? And I think Europe has been very clear from the outset. And indeed, the United Kingdom signed up to the political declaration. And here I have a slight concern because it seems very clear to me that there is an attempt to move away from uh, the um, concept and content of the political declaration more towards the Conservative Party's manifesto in the election. And I think this came up recently when the leaders here spoke uh, and were joined by the British Prime Minister. Um, in good faith, both parties signed to that political declaration. And, and we all know that even in the withdrawal agreement, there was some effort, small and unsuccessful, on the UK side to look at some small parts of it around geographical indicators, so around and food, etc. So, you know, we have to be very straight with each other. I think we have to respect each other's different positions, respect each other as equal partners, but also be able to say as friends that when we feel that, you know, a line is being crossed, that we can say a line is being crossed and that therefore when the parties sit down next week. I think the language will probably be clearer. I don't think they'll be relying on technology, so they'll be in the room and maybe over those quiet moments of a coffee or a tea or I won't say a cigarette because that's not allowed uh, in, in Brussels, but whatever it takes, I think sometimes it is those quiet personal conversations that allow negotiators to move to another place and break the deadlock. And my goodness, we need to break the deadlock now. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Maureen. Charles, last word to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, uh, of course, I covered quite a bit of this in, in opening because the joint committee structure is a thing that needs to address a lot of these areas. It needs to get going because pretty well wherever you end up um, with the future negotiations, you are going to need to be clear what a good at risk is. So you need to have a large number of people talking about the real in-depth stuff. So 15 pages of articles needs to become a telephone directory of, uh, of small helpful things so that business can uh, be uh, can function properly. Um, what I would say is that um, I know there are concerns on the European Union side that the withdrawal agreement is not being respected. Um, and this uh, lack of trust between the parties is actually becoming a problem and we have a, a theme in discussing that that's not for the t today 
But at a personal level, I can say I don't think anyone that I've met uh, on the British government side is intending not to respect an international agreement. It's, it's never been the case that it's not respecting it. There, there are definitely some differences of interpretation in what is actually quite high level language. And, and, and that's not for today to discuss, but it's pretty difficult. If the, uh, uh, and just like the future negotiations, if we don't manage to agree a whole lot of stuff that the Joint Committee needs to agree, and it's all laid out in our report, in fact, um, what the Joint Committee needs to do, if they, if they don't manage to do that by uh, the end of the transition period, then um, there's, a, there's a nasty awaiting everyone, just as there is a nasty awaiting everyone if the future negotiations don't produce a result. If, on the other hand, the future negotiations do produce a result and do produce a good free trade agreement, then, in fact, implementing the protocol becomes a lot simpler because quite a lot of the processes will become uh, simpler because of the free trade agreement. They won't go away any of the processes totally, but they will become a lot simpler. And finally, just to comment on the, the Belfast office, it's, of course, incredibly unlucky it's become a heavily politicised thing within Northern Ireland. So it's, it's quite difficult um, because of that. But it does seem to me that that aside, it's slightly ready fire aim in that you, at the moment, because there isn't actually any agreement or, and the Joint Committee hasn't done its work, one doesn't have a clue what is actually required. And one therefore doesn't know whether one needs an office or if one has an office, what it will have to do. And I think that I hope that all parties can leave the office question aside a bit um, for a moment while we work out what needs to be done. And then it'll be obvious to everyone whether, because there are rights of verification for the European Union under the withdrawal agreement, whether in fact an office is required and what its functions will be. And I, I think we can just park that one for the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, and I am obliged to say that the Twitter handle for the Lords EU Committee is at Lords EU Com. <laughs> um, um, so uh, I um, thank you very much. Uh, I just wish to apologise to all of those who asked excellent questions and which we weren't able to get to. Um, but um, I hope, um, I have no doubt that you all found uh, the contributions of the panel both um, informed and informative as well. And it was a very positive discussion uh, given the topic. So I'm delighted to hand over to um, James Temple Smithson, uh, who is head of the European Parliament Office in Dublin. Thank you, James. Thank you very much, Katie. Um, in closing, I'll be brief because I'm sure some people want to um, hop across channels to listen to the end of uh, Tony Connolly's um, session at the IIEA or, or even just to get to lunch. So um, I'll, just, I'll just make one point if I can, which is this, that for all of the um, starring role that the uh, House of Commons had before the last UK general election, which um, Katie referred to earlier, um, I think it is possible for the role of the parliamentary aspect of Brexit to be overlooked. Um, and I think in organizing this event, what we wanted to try and do was, was, was um, address that and highlight that role. Um, and uh, I think thanks to our really senior and expert panel, we've managed to do that. We, we heard from Mairead about the, the meeting with the national parliamentarians um, from around the EU today. And it's clear that with, with those, with the, with, the, with the European Parliament itself, with the um, national and regional parliaments assemblies in the UK, um, that not only do they all have an important political and, and legal role in this, but that also they can make a very positive uh, contribution to, to the outcomes. Um, so I'm very grateful to all of our panel um, for helping make um, many other points as well, but making that point in particular. So um, to uh, Vice President McGuinness, uh, Lord Canool, and uh, Minister Naomi Long, thank you all very much. Um, thank you uh, to Katie Hayward for uh, chairing this so knowledgeably and deftly. And then finally, most of all, to, to the audience, to all of you for tuning in. Um, thank you very much and good afternoon. <laughs>